Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program 2 video, which is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, in which I embark to build a rocket with a curse. You see, the Kerbal Space Program official Twitter account recently posted the 40th weekly challenge for the game. Build the most cursed rocket. And you know, I was thinking about what to do for this week's Kerbal Space Program video, and I'm not gonna lie, Christmas time, it's busy at work, I didn't have that much time to do a, a big intricate mission, and I feel like, you know, last week's video was pretty big, so this week, let's just check out what the what the weekly challenge is, and try our best at fulfilling that. And so that's that brings us back to the, the subject, which is, of course, what I'm building on screen. And can you tell what makes this rocket cursed yet? Um, it's the fact that this lower stage uh, is actually way too big. I end, I'm gonna end up uh, shrinking it down and making it smaller, but I had to leave this bit of the build in because then uh, you wouldn't see me coloring the rocket in in this color, and that's what makes this rocket cursed. Uh, joking, obviously, that would be very, very rubbish, wouldn't it? I'm gonna keep it to myself for now exactly what makes this rocket cursed. Maybe it's this bit I'm doing now. What the devils am I doing? Uh, actually, I'm just adding a probe core and reaction wheel to the upper stage of the rocket so it can deal with itself and not leave any debris in space. So all in all, it's a pretty bog standard rocket, right? It's just basically an Apollo style moon rocket. So you're probably all sitting there scratching your heads thinking, what is Matt gonna do to make this curse? Well, let me tell you, we're gonna hit control A, grab the rocket and with two key presses, boom. I just wanted to confirm uh, that the pointy end is down and the flamey end is up. I never in a million years would have thought this would have happened. That's right, I decided to combine this week's challenge with one of my favorite ever Reddit challenges. Oh man, 10 years ago, really? In this challenge called UpGoer5, you need to build a rocket that launches upside down. Prior to engine start, all engines and thrust generating components must point the wrong way towards the sky with the pointy end facing down. And this Reddit challenge itself is a reference to an XKCD comic titled UpGoer5. Get it? It's like parody of Saturn V, UpGoer5. It's basically a big poster that gives a humorous breakdown of the anatomy of the Saturn V moon rocket. And everyone's favorite quote from this poster has got to be what it says when describing the engines. This end should point toward the ground if you want to go to space. If it starts pointing towards space, you are having a bad problem and you will not go to space today. This Reddit challenge aimed to challenge Professor XKCD's, if that is their real name, credentials when critiquing craft for common line crossing escapes. And there were some pretty funny entries. I think my favorite was probably this one by user The Real. And I've never actually done this challenge in KSB1 or KSB2, so why not try it today? <laughs> and hey, I'd love to see you guys attempt this as well. So post to like, I don't know, my subreddit or the official Kerbal Space Program subreddit. We can get a little trend going once again, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I should be so arrogant into my influence over this community. But I had a good old think in terms of how I wanted to get my rocket pointing flamey end down and pointy end up so we could actually, you know, get to space. And I remembered that some of the entrants to the original Reddit challenge all those 10 years ago made like big wheels out of the structural pieces and then just had the whole thing roll so the rocket would then be pointing the right way up and then it could just launch. And I don't know, it just seemed really funny to me. <laughs> like it's such a creative way of, you know, doing it. And you know, I, I don't think I could come up with a funnier way. So that's what I decided to do for my rocket. I just added those two big decouplers and constructed this giant ring out of the structural pieces. Now I was a bit scared because this is Kerbal Space Program 2. So I was a bit apprehensive that the whole thing might just wobble itself to pieces and not work as intended. But KSB1 10 years ago was also a very janky game. And it worked then, who's to say it shouldn't work now? So I've got the basic frame there, all constructed. Let's perform our first test launch. Oh my goodness, <gasps> I selected the wrong, I was meant to select the runway guys, but I must have selected the wrong launch site and now it's been launched into the surf. Hopefully there aren't any sharks to eat the crew. Um, there's a segue there, right? Surfshark, the go-to VPN for all your online needs and sponsor of today's video. You already know how crucial it is to stay connected online, be it for work, school, or just keeping up with your friends and family. But here's the thing, every time you connect to the internet, your data could be vulnerable. Enter Surfshark VPN, your ultimate digital guardian. It's like having your own superhero. 
protecting you from prying eyes and potential online threats. Surfshark encrypts your internet connection, ensuring that your personal information and browsing history stay private and secure. But that's not all. With just one click, Surfshark lets you switch your virtual location. Imagine unlocking content from around the globe, giving you access to your favorite shows, movies, and websites that might be hiding from you in your own streaming service. Now, what I love about Surfshark is just how user-friendly it is. It's perfect for everyone, whether you're a tech pro or just dipping your toes into the world of VPNs. And if you ever need a helping hand, their 24-7 custom support is ready and waiting. And I've been working with Surfshark to bring you all an exclusive Surfshark holiday deal. Head on over to surfshark.deals/matlown and enter the promo code MATLOWN to get up to six additional months for free. You can find the link to click in the description and pinned comment. Sponsors like Surfshark allow me to keep on making this kind of content for you all, so massive thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. The go-to VPN for all your online needs aside, I realized if I wanted this thing to work for real, I'd need to add a couple more things, namely some very large reaction wheels so that this thing has the necessary torque to roll itself over. Here is my uh, first test of this. As you can see, didn't really do a lot to be honest. So I went back to the vehicle assembly building and added some um, helping hands in the form of more boosters. And I realize now, as I'm editing this video, that this might actually disqualify me from the original rules of that 10-year-old Reddit challenge because it said all engines need to be pointing upwards. I wasn't actually aware of that rule, I just vaguely remembered this upside-down Reddit challenge thing, made this video, and then checked the challenge so I could get the screen cap for this video. So that was a whoops on my part, also a whoops on my part. Uh, this thing still couldn't roll over very well, it was very too narrow. So I just used a little bit of cheeky offsetting to make the footprint of our roly-poly rig a bit wider, and then all was ready for launch. Never in a million years would have thought this would happen. Uh, I, I I don't know. <laughs> I, I felt like the absurdity of this launch uh, warranted some little bit of extra editing flair. So uh, hope you enjoyed that little launch sequence. Uh, but of course, here we are in the air. On our way to space, the flamey end is pointing down and the pointy end is pointing up. Well, actually, the whole thing is sort of at a bit of an oblique angle right now because we're in the middle of performing our gravity turn. Now, the upside down launch is not the only cursed thing in this video and it's also not the only thing that kind of pays homage to the whole the engines need to be pointing downward in order to go to space. Uh, I'm going to withhold the exact details of that, though, to, uh, you know, not only encourage viewer retention, but also, you know, keep you guys guessing, keep you on your toes, keep this video cool and fun. And if you are enjoying the video so far, or oh, if you leave a little like down below, that really helps me out, mateys. <laughs> anyway, would you look at that? We have proven XKCD incorrect with their assertion that the engines need to be pointing down upon launch because we have made it to space. And in just a second, we have made it. There we are. <laughs> we have made it to stable orbit in space as well, thus fulfilling the challenge. Although, you know, I got to go a little bit above and beyond. The actual Reddit challenge itself just said that, uh, you know, get to space. If you want to get hard mode, that's uh, get to the mun. And if you want expert mode, that's uh, go to a planet outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence. So I did consider taking this thing to Duna. It just about has the Delta V necessary. But then I remember that I, like, I've been to Juna, like, like, my past three videos have been going to Juna. Well, I mean, one of them was going to Mars in RSS, but, you know, it's it, Juna, right? So I was like, let's go to the Mun and to Minmus, like, in one. So we can really, like, show that. That's kind of like, a, that's harder than hard mode. I guess it's not quite expert mode because there's no interplanetary travel involved. But, you know, it is a step up, so hopefully that. And the challenge is ten years old at this point. I don't really care. This is really my own thing at this point. Here's another cursed thing. 
Uh, the docking ports in KSP2 are still a bit janky, so when you detach them, it induces a bit of, I don't know, radial out velocity to one of the craft, so that I had to sort of, uh, surgically boop it so that its docking port was aligned with our command module. I know I could have put a Kerbal on EVA, got in the lander, and used the lander's SAS, but, you know, that wouldn't have been cursed. That's right, it was a pl I planned that they, for the entire- I didn't, I didn't plan that. I'm not going to admit to that. I'm not that good. <laughs> but some things, guys, I am too good for. And one thing I decided I was too good for, I, I think you can see me deliberating if I should go to Minmus first or the Mun first. Then I decided I was going to go to the Mun. And I said, you know what? I'm too good for this. I'm too good for Maneuver Nodes. Let's go to the Mun the old school KSP-1 and the old school KSP-2 way. Uh, I find it ironic that this was how we had to get to the Mun in the beginnings of both games' lives. KSP-1, there never was a maneuver node planner initially, so the only way you could get to the Mun was by doing this trick. When you're in orbit, wait until you can just see the Mun uh, emerging from behind Kerbin, then just burn prograde, and you'll get a nice encounter. And you had to do this when KSP-2 first came out, because although you could make maneuver nodes from day one, uh, you couldn't see what your trajectory would be around the planet or moon you were heading towards. So it was really difficult to know what your orbit would be, basically. And so this was really the only way to reliably get a nice equatorial orbit around the Mun. We, you know, like, so, so that's... That's, a, that's something I just realised now, actually, doing this commentary, so isn't that insightful? But the game has uh, come on leaps and bounds, <laughs> hasn't it? Like, sometimes I go back and watch my old videos, you know, when I was doing, like, three videos a week. Gosh, that nearly killed me. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, how did I do this? Because I forget, I had to, like, speed my videos up by, like, eight times to get the frame rate up to an acceptable and watchable level. Like, my initial day one livestream, the whole getting the Kerbal Space Center to orbit notwithstanding, like, the frame rate on, like, walking around Minmus was, like, ten. And I've got a 4090 graphics card, so it's not like my PC is underpowered. And I look at where we are now, and yes, the game... It's still a long way from being as good as KSP-1, I probably wouldn't recommend buying it to most players yet, but I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it's playable, you know? <laughs> and I'm really, really optimistic about 4 Science. I was optimistic about KSP-2 just generally as a game, and uh, we all know how that turned out. So with regard to 4 Science, I'm remaining cautiously optimistic. I'm hoping for the best, expecting the worst, and then we should be in a happy middle ground. But I am very much looking forward to 4 Science, even if there's no fixes to any glitches, which is not going to be the case. They have confirmed there's going to be a lot of things fixed, including wobbly rockets, yes. But it just gives the game some purpose. Um, although I am motivated to play this game because it's my livelihood, <laughs> it is hard doing missions and having like a fun little thing to do on those missions because all you can do is like land and plant a flag and that's it. But doing science, although I guess it doesn't add a whole lot to the overall video's narrative, um, I realised how much I missed it, you know. So I'm really looking forward to being able to do science and seeing what all the experiments are. There's some really mysterious looking ones, like Aquatic Sciences is one of the nodes on the new tech tree. Don't know what that could be, there's speculation that one of the parts is a diving bell. Um, we'll have to just wait and see. Anyway, we're about to touch down. The landing legs are deployed. Our velocity is approaching zero, but wait! That's right! We are once again pointy-ish end down, flamey end up. We're landing Australian style, my friends. We're landing upside down. So uh, that's a continuation of the upside down theme of this mission. So we can get our two Kerbals out on EVA, and then we can say a big old good day to the Mun and uh, plant our flag. And yeah, that that is uh, kind of going back to what I was just talking about. It's kind of a shame that this is all you can really do in Kerbal Space Program 2 at the moment. Uh, so uh, there's a nice little cinematic, uh, what's this shot called? Like a tracking, a dolly cam shot, maybe? I don't know, someone's gonna correct me in the comments probably, but there's my little shot there. Again, really looking forward to four science, we can collect some surface samples, do some aquatic science maybe, right? Shackleton crater is speculated to have water ice, that's on the moon, and this is the mun, so you know, the same the same place. I mean, I'm guessing Aquatic Sciences is mostly going to be used for Lathe and Eve and Kerbin, and, you know, eventually when Interstellar is added, the other Interstellar places. Oh, I guess, um, uh, what's it called? Val has an ocean, doesn't it? So maybe there as well. 
Or maybe things like water ice are included in the whole aquatic sciences thing. I'm doubtful, but maybe. I mean, there's probably already been a leak or someone's found one frame in one video from two years ago that actually tells us what the aquatic sciences node is, and I just somehow missed that. Anyway, whoops, I didn't talk about the takeoff. I mean, you guys are smart, you could probably see what was going on, right? We did a little roly-poly and uh, flipped ourselves flamey ends down and launched. Uh, much easier to do on the low surface gravity of the man with a very small craft like this that's kind of uh, ball-shaped. I mean, it's a cylinder. We're not rolling along the curved axis of the cylinder, but it's a cylinder nonetheless. In an ideal world, I would have lifted off using the monopropellant thrusters, but we don't have the thrust rate ratio on the MUN. Maybe we do on Minmus. Hmm, we'll have to just wait and see how that one goes. But for now, we will uh, get back to the mothership, which is pretty easy at this part in the mission because we've got a, uh, we can make a maneuver node, plot ourselves to get nice and close. Things will not go as smoothly <laughs> for the Minmus side of things. Um, this was cursed by the Kraken, as well as being inherently cursed by nature because we launched upside down. So many, so many plot twists. Yes, I'm making a video that encourages retention. I never do that. I always like start videos all bombastic, like, oh, hey guys, wow, editing. And then after five minutes, I'm like, just talking about fish fingers or something stupid and irrelevant. <laughs> it's very telling that like I recently published a like well recently last my last video in Kerbal Space Program was a fifty something minute thing and I was like wow the commentary Matt talks about the what's on screen the entire time and I'm like yeah I know but I mean I, uh, there comes a point where I can't it's gonna be very boring. Just hearing me say the same exact thing for Apollo Star Mun missions. How many of these videos have I done at this point? <laughs> you know, I can't keep saying the same thing over and over again. And I feel like the personality, you know, the, the the conversational tone, the little relationship that we have, where I'm like, it's not a very interesting conversation, right? Because I'm just talking at you for 20 minutes or however long this video ends up being, like probably like close to 25 minutes, right? But it's a conversational tone nonetheless. I feel like it just creates a nice sort of, what's, what, what do the kids say these days, vibe? Or as I, I think it was H. Bobber guy said in his most recent video, adults pretending to be children, say vibe or riz or something like that. Great video, by the way. H. Bomber guy videos are always home runs, in my opinion. But it was quite scary to watch. He was uh, calling out YouTubers who uh, plagiarize things, including Internet Historian, which is really uh, a shame, to be honest. And I get really scared about accidentally plagiarizing someone to the point like, not if a couple space program, obviously, because I'm the best. No, that that's not true. But for things like Space This Week, you know, it's not just me making these videos, right? Scott Manley, Marcus House, What About It. We all kind of make very similar content. And I actually don't watch any of them because I don't want to accidentally assimilate what they said and then end up saying the exact same thing. Because it is really hard to word things differently when you're talking about a tin can moving around on a beach in Texas. <laughs> so I don't want to like, I, I'll like write my script and then I might watch them after the fact just so I can make sure I didn't miss anything or like, oh, that's a clever way of wording that and things. But I do get very scared about watching them because I don't want to like accidentally end up saying the exact same thing. There are probably examples where I have. Sorry, I didn't mean to. The only thing I will say that I probably did plagiarize is that I kind of had to copy their thumbnail style because of those stupid, finally happened, stupid AI clickbait videos. I had to like, well, everyone knows Marcus is and what about its videos are genuine. So I, if I make my thumbnails look like theirs, then people will know that mine aren't AI generated waffles. <laughs> so that's kind of, you gotta follow the trends to an extent. <laughs> So I, I guess I didn't really need to be scared about being exposed by H Bomber Guy because I've just gone and cancelled myself. No, but that this was all that was all a joke, by the way. I genuinely have don't plagiarize people. Anyway, we are on the way to Minmus. Let's skedaddle away from that topic. Yeah, and with the Minmus mission, uh things don't go quite as I hoped they would. I mean we we do it, it's all a success. Do not worry about that. I like to think at this stage in my Kerbal Space Program career. I can do a minimus landing, okay, but there were some issues. It was a bit of a, how you say, cursed, eh? It was a bit cursed, this theme of the video and all that shebang. Uh, yeah, you, you, you'll you just wait and see. It's coming up in a second. It's going to be easier for you to just see what the problem was than me describing it ahead of time. And then obviously if I don't describe it ahead of time, I then will be able to talk about it when it happens and I won't just be sat there thinking, oh no, I've already talked about all of this. Oop. <laughs> Because, you know, that, that is something that happens quite a lot in my commentaries. I, I, you'd think I'd be good at it at this point. Um, I don't know. I sometimes watch, like, my old commentaries from, like, 2017. And 
I like to think I've got a bit more energy since then. I've got a better microphone now, obviously. I was using a, I used a blue Snowball, then I had a blue Yeti. Now I've got a Rode Procaster, so that helps. And I guess I'm just a little bit less self-conscious as well. I mean, the difference, a big difference was uh, in 2019, I moved out of shared accommodation into my own house. So I was a bit less embarrassed about just like people overhearing me whilst they were trying to live their lives in the home that we all shared together. And then they could just hear me going, hey guys, welcome to Kel's Face Program uh, in the other room. So maybe it's a silly thing to feel self-conscious about, but anyway. As you can see, the landing is happening in the pitch black. So I'll, I'll add some brightness filters on the video editor. Don't know if it's going to make that much difference, but maybe it helps. And actually, you can see the cursed thing, right? On the bottom right of the screen, we have no stages. I don't know why. The game just couldn't tell that this was a rocket with fuel and an engine. So although it all worked, I couldn't see my Delta V readouts, and I couldn't quickly see how much fuel I had left. So this is all a bit of a... A thing about, oh, I don't know, I've got enough fuel to do the things I need to do. And I knew mathematically we had the Delta V. When it came to things like doing, you know, the rendezvous with the mothership in orbit. Oh, I don't know how much Delta V I've got left. <laughs> there was also another very, very annoying issue associated with this bug that will become apparent once we take off again. But for now, we can plant a flag. I tried to get a nice camera angle to showcase this, but the camera sort of glitched out a bit and then you just got that nauseating um, whooshing around whilst I was trying to target the, the flag and then it was too late. So, but we've planted the flag. Now we can get our kerbals out so we can get a nice photo opportunity. There we are. What did, what did I decide this was called again? A dolly, a dolly cam shot? No, no, no. There's the kerbals there. Uh, just uh, just standing super cash, I guess, with the, uh, once again, landed upside down lander. You might be wondering why I actually bothered putting landing legs on it, right? Because my, it was actually my intention to land like this on every, uh, well, on the, when I, when I did my landings on the Mun and Minmus. But they are there for a reason, a reason that'll become apparent soon. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think you're gonna like it. Uh, now we can get to our takeoff. So we can set the mothership as our target and then we can lift off. And here is the issue that I had, right? So, because the game doesn't consider this a rocket with stages that can be flown, uh, we can't make a maneuver node. So I had to just sort of uh, guess <laughs> how to get a counter. And in the end, I was like, you know what? We've probably got enough delta V to just burn towards our target and do things super inefficiently. And as long as we're in an orbit, the mothership can do the rendezvous if the lander runs out of fuel. But I was optimistic that we would be able to do things. The first things first, I uh, killed my speed relative to our target so that we can have a, an orbit similar to the target with the two craft in roughly similar locations. And then we can just do some burning towards the target to get the separation nodes nice and close. And then once we're close, it'll be easy. We can just burn retrograde for a bit, then burn prograde for a bit, and retro etc, etc. It's generally how I do docking anyway, because I'm lazy. <laughs> You might have seen actually very briefly just then you saw me opening the resource panel of the game just so we could see how much fuel we had when I reckoned I had enough. I didn't really know how exactly it translated into Delta V but there was a fair chunk of fuel remaining. I knew it wouldn't need that much Delta V to perform the actual docking itself so I figured uh, we can just we can relax now. And uh, yeah once again happening in the pitch black and I don't th I added a brightness filter for the Minmus landing but then when I watched it back I feel like I didn't really do a lot, so I probably won't bother doing a brightness filter for this. We could just do the docking. You saw the numbers on the screen and we did it. And now we can teleport, not teleport, time warp to the daytime side of the moon. And, well, uh, well, there you are. We can just get this thing ready to go back to using the mothership's engine to perform our uh, escape from Minmus and to perform our re-entry into Kerbin's atmosphere. One of the last times I'll be doing a Kerbin re-entry with no re-entry heating to worry about. I mean, just because it's good practice for basically all of my KSP2 videos, bar a couple, uh, I've been using uh, heat shields and stuff just so that, you know, when re-entry heating comes around, we're all, I'm used to it, and anyone that's kind of new to the game has seen missions being done with consideration being made for re-entry heating. I hope it makes them a little bit more prepared for when re-entry heating becomes a thing you need to worry about. And as you can see, the last of the burns is done. We have our Kerbin re-entry. Oh, oh, hang on. A little bit of a puff there to lower my pairapses a bit more. Then we can time warp down to the blue planet and get ready to stage, deploy our parachutes and touch down. Oh no, I've I've made a bit of a mistake. Uh, obviously, obviously I, must, I must not have noticed at the time, but I've left the lander attached to the 
command module. <gasps> what a disaster. Aha. Of course. This is... I meant to do this. Do you remember when I said all those years ago when I was on Minmus uh, that I did actually add landing legs to the lander for a reason? Well, there you go. This is why. So now we can land upside down once again. I say upside down because the command module, which is where the Kerbals are sitting, uh, is upside down. And we can use the landing legs of the lander to touch down safely. We are coming in pretty fast. I probably should have added more parachutes to the command module, but we've got the Terrier engine. We had just enough fuel left to slow us down somewhat. I mean, the Terrier engine is very weak, so it didn't really do much, but it did enough. And there we have it. A beautiful photogenic upside down landing and a beautiful conclusion to this video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was all made possible thanks to the wonderful names on screen, my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members, as well as, of course, our fantastic sponsor for today, which was Surfshark VPN. Remember that you can get an exclusive Surfshark holiday deal by entering the code MATLOWN to get up to six additional months for free at surfshark.deals slash MATLOWN. But once again, that is the end of the video. There's two more videos on the screen that you can click on. They're also made by me, so they're good, right? Uh, bye.